Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I think Dr. Corwin, we can get started if that's okay with you. We're right at the top of the hour. That sounds great. I'm really happy everybody is here. So many people are here today. Good afternoon and welcome to our very first of the year of the academic year, Reach for Research Excellence or REX seminar. So we call this the REX seminar and that's what it stands for, Research for Research, Reach for Research Excellence. Today's presentation will be led by Dr. Jacqueline Taylor, the Helen F. Petit Professor of Nursing and the founding executive director of the Center for Research on People of Color. She is also the founding executive director of the Kathleen Hickey Endowed Lectureship on Cardiovascular Care, the first endowed lectureship honoring a nurse scientist at Columbia University. And she is also a senior advisor to the chair of the Division of Cardiology at Columbia University Medical Center. Jackie has been a true trailblazer in cardiovascular genomics research among minority populations and is a committed mentor, as everybody in the school knows. In 2021, um, Jackie received the Columbia University Irving Medical Center Mentor of the Year Award. That is a really big deal here at Columbia. We're very proud of it and um, of Dr. Taylor. Today, we will hear from two students who worked with Dr. Taylor this year as part of the Research Education and Cardiovascular Conditions Program, an NHLBI-funded R25 seminar internship program. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Taylor now to introduce her two students, whom we're very happy to have joined us today, and to tell us a little bit more about the program. Jackie? Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Corwin, for that lovely introduction. I'm always so honored to present the students and the work that they've done over the summer here with us at Columbia University and at NYU. As Dr. Corwin mentioned, um, this is uh, we were able to uh, provide this RECEIVE program, which is Research Education and Cardiovascular Disease, which is a hands-on 10-week um, um, experience for undergraduate and graduate students in the health sciences, so nursing, medical, public health, dentistry students, to gain experiences in cardiovascular research. We uh, pair students with, with mentors from across those various fields based on their area of interest, and we had the pleasure of working with uh, Rose Jackson and Kendall Morgan uh, this summer. We receive a ton of applications every year. It's a very, very, very competitive process. So these students are the top of the top and you know, just the very best. And we, we always have a, a wonderful time with the students for the 10 weeks that they're with us in the summer. As you can see here, this is the information on receive. We will put out applications for a new cohort in February, and there are also opportunities for members of the previous cohort to come back and, and become peer mentors to the new cohort. We accept only about 12 to 15 students, but like I said, we receive, you know, lots of applications. So um, again, it's very competitive, and we were truly honored to have um, Rose Jackson and Kendall Morgan to work with us. Um, so we're going to start with Kendall. Um, she is a student at third year nursing student at The Ohio State University. She is originally from Chicago, Illinois. We have students from all across the country. Um, she has been an active member of various organizations, including Nursing Students of Color, the March of Dimes, the Undergraduate Society of Black Leaders, and College Mentors for Kids. Kendall's passion for research is exemplified by her recent participation in our summer program. And she had the pleasure of working with our faculty member, Dr. Veronica Barcelona. Um, she was able to conduct research um, looking at the RN to PhD pipeline and Kendall envisions herself pursuing a career in women's health. So we're gonna hear from Kendall on her project and then I will introduce Rose, and then we will um, hear from Rose on her project. So Kendall, if you're able to share your screen, could you please do so? And we'll, we'd like to hear about your project. All right. Can you guys see my screen? All right, perfect. Hello, 
My name is Kendall Morgan. I am a third year at The Ohio State University as a traditional BSN student, minoring in global public health, and I have had the opportunity to work with Jada Lee and the pleasure to work under Dr. Veronica Barcelona from Columbia University for this project. I would like to start off by saying I've enjoyed my past summer with the RECV program and working with Dr. Barcelona. And I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Dixon from NYU and Dr. Taylor from Columbia University for facilitating this amazing program and allow me to participate. Through this program, I've been able to hear from many speakers from a variety of topics, such as writing for publication, health disparities in cardiovascular diseases, and social determinants of CVD health, to name a few. For my presentation today, I will present my project that focuses on the time between RN and PhD prepared nurses, where we will look into NIH funding for nurse scientists. I would like to highlight that this study is still currently in progress and that we are still collecting data. Therefore, today, I will be sharing the progress we as a team made thus far this summer, and to provide a background on the RN to PhD pipeline. A little bit of background to begin. Nurses with a PhD are needed to develop knowledge that informs and directs nursing care, promote positive health outcomes, and train the next generation of nurses and nurse scientists. However, according to the 2017 National Nursing Workforce Survey, less than 1% of nurses have their PhD in nursing, and there is an ongoing shortage of nurses in the US that has not been effectively addressed. And this number is expected to decline as, as PhD nurse faculty retire. The current shortage in nursing faculty is connected to the lack of nurse scientists in the workforce. The PhD in nursing pipeline needs to be reinforced to address the escalating nursing shortage and help supply future faculty, researchers, and leaders in nursing. PhD prepared nurses are integral to the delivery of cost-effective, safe, and high-quality care to the increasingly diverse population in the U.S. To achieve its vision of improving health outcomes for all people, particularly those in populations experiencing so social and health inequities, the profession must produce and support PhD prepared nurses, nurse educators, and nurse scientists who reflect the broad diversity of the society as a whole. Given the emergence of new and re-emerging infectious diseases, growth of racial and ethnic populations, demand of chronic illness care, and changes in healthcare delivery, advances in data science and analytic approaches and increasing globalization, strong scientific foundations are required to ensure effectiveness and efficiency, as well as methods to translate knowledge into practice. Despite this great need, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing has seen a decline in enrollment in PhD programs over the last 10 years. Since 2012, the enrollments have declined to 12%, from 5,110 to 4,476 students, even though graduations have increased 20% from 611 to 733 graduates. This can also be seen in the graph shown before you today. However, during this period, the number of research-focused doctoral nursing programs has increased 14% from 131 to 149. These programs are now available in almost every state. Like mentioned early, earlier, PhD is a research-focused degree that prepares individuals to create, translate, and communicate new knowledge as leaders within institutions of higher education and outside of academia. Postdoctoral study is recommended for individuals who plan to pursue careers in a research-intensive environment and wish to acquire expert understanding of the theories, methods, and analytics of a field. The aim and objectives. The purpose of this study is to examine the associations between length of time from initial nursing licensure to doctoral degree attainment and subsequent NIH funding. We believe that the length of time between initial licensure and doctoral degree Completion will not be associated with receiving NIH funding. The study aim is to assess the length of time between initial nursing license and nursing doctoral degree attainment among nurses who have received NIH funding through NINR from 2012 to 2022. The methods. 
This is a retrospective study, and for this project, we are looking at neuroscientists who have received NIH funding in the past 10 years, specifically from year 2012 to year 2022, and find out when they defended their dissertations and when they completed their first nursing degree slash RN licensure. We will study publicly available databases, including NIH Reporter, ProQuest, Nurses, institutional web pages, academic websites, and LinkedIn to determine whether the length of time between becoming a registered nurse and obtaining the doctoral degree is associated with obtaining NIH funding. First, we created an NIH reporter query to make a list of projects that have been funded by the NIH from 2012 to 2022. The query was made on June 22nd of 2023 and includes 10 years of NIH funding from 2012 to 2022. This includes new awards only, excluding competing renewals or non-competing and revision or supplements. It is NINR only and it's excluding any subprojects. Next, we use the test data to refine the data collection instrument via REDCap. REDCap is an online application that was developed by Vanderbilt University as a tool to capture data for clinical research and create databases and projects. Next, we will determine if the contact PI slash project leader is a nurse scientist or not via nurses, institutional web pages, academic websites, and LinkedIn. Then we would exclude those in the query who are not nurse scientists, who don't have an RN and PhD, or have not completed their PhD as of 2022. Ex then we would exclude nurse scientists who have received intramural grants. Then we will record information about earliest RN licensure via nurses, PhD dissertation defense date via ProQuest, and other relevant variables into REDCap. REDCap will be used to organize and compile all of the data received from these three databases. The discussion. A barrier to returning to school to become a nursing faculty is the need for graduate study, and many nurses are told to practice clinically before obtaining graduate degrees, reducing the number of nurses who become nurse scientists and nurse faculty. There is no evidence, however, to support the greater success of nurses who wait to pursue advanced education. In fact, nurses are often less likely to return for more education with increased years of clinical experience due to cost, family responsibilities, and other factors. One of the main ways that success for nurse scientists is determined through obtaining funds for research from the National Institute of Health. This work will inform strategies to improve nurse scientists recruitment and retention and has important program and policy implications for nursing schools looking to improve the numbers of nurse scientists working in faculty positions. Many programs that are RN to PhD have naysayers and we are trying to disprove slash change the belief that nurses cannot become nurse scientists without working in the clinic for any set amount of time. I believe it is important to incorporate research into undergraduate experiences and promote engaged mentorship during undergraduate level and beyond and provide a conducive environment for students to address their fears, misconceptions, and myths about PhD nursing. That will conclude my presentation. I will now open the floor for questions or questions after the next presentation. Thank you so much, Kendall. That was an excellent presentation. We're gonna wait until uh, Rose had a, has had a chance to present and then we'll have Q&A for both presentations because I, I know you have to, uh, the two of you have to get to class. So <laughs> we will we will make sure that you um, meet your obligations here. So our, our um, other uh, student that had a chance to work with us here at Columbia University. Like I said, we had about we had about 12 students, but they were across NYU and Columbia and other places. Um, was Rose Jackson. She worked closely with Jelade Kalinowski, who was um, a former postdoc of mine at NYU and is now a professor in population health at um, UConn. And she was one of our speakers, our anti-racism um, um, speakers uh, last year. Uh, Rose uh, is currently a senior nursing student at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University and is originally from Detroit, Michigan. Throughout her time as a student, she's made the dean's list and chancellor list, and um, she's been accepted as an honor student um, last year. So again, these students are the cream of the crop and the very best. 
Um, outside of nursing, she has also founded a convention that brings creativity and expression to her college campus. So they are exemplary in, in many ways. And this summer, she had the ability to uh, work with us in the RECEIVE program here at Columbia and NYU. And she conducted a literature review, which she will present to us today. And her literature review was on Black women's perspective on physical activity and analysis of perspective barriers and facilitators. So Rose, if you're able to share your screen, um, we can hear from you. Oh, there you go. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, so good morning, or sorry, not good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> Can you put this in everybody. this interview? Um, there you go. There. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Rose Jackson, and I am a senior nursing student uh, from North Carolina A&T. This summer, I was an RECV scholar, um, like Dr. Taylor said. So my presentation is a literature review of Black women's perspective on physical activity. Um, so throughout this presentation, I will discuss the background and purpose of this uh, research review. And uh, each article that was reviewed was related to Black women and their perspective or barriers or influences on their engagement in physical activity. Uh, we will also discuss the similarities and weaknesses uh, within these articles, as well as any gaps in the literature and what could be done differently. So African-American or Black women are reportedly the least physically active group amongst the United States as a whole. Um, and there are numerous reasons for this, um, ranging from health, hair care to self-esteem to lack of motivation. Um, the lack of physical activity engagement is also suggested to lead to chronic health conditions such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and many more. The purpose of this literature review was to analyze data collected on Black women's perspective of physical activity, along with any potential barriers and influences on the adherence of their physical activity. Um, my process included using the research in the search engines, uh, Google Scholar, PubMed, and Sin Hall Ultimate. I reviewed a total of 55 articles that ranged from 2012 to 2022. And my keywords that I use were women, female, black women, black female, exercise, physical activity, African-American, Nigerian, Afro-Caribbean, and barriers. And this is a quote from Kalima Johnson, a PhD candidate from Wayne State University. Exercise is affected by many factors in a black woman's life, from trauma responses to lack of time. This chart originally contained 55 articles and literature and then was further compressed into 11 of the most detailed and relevant data. The similarities found amongst the literature and articles were what the barriers and facilitators were. Stress, time, lack of support, perceived safety, affordability, accessibility to facilities and green spaces or parks were considered barriers. And then familial, social, community support stress relief, wanting to be healthy or maintaining their overall health, and a desire to lose or maintain weight were considered facilitators of physical activity. Many of the interventions were interviews, which was also used as a data collection method. Focus groups, weight loss or physical activity promotion programs, educational sessions that were conducted by nurses, and technology-based tracking using accelerometers or websites were also used. Of the review literature and research, majority of the sample sizes were relatively small. However, 42% of the literature and research had sample sizes ranging from 143 to 49,000 participants. So let's review. In more than five of the articles, the data or information was not made clear, which made it difficult to comprehend without rereading multiple times. Aside from this, a larger part of the findings were exceedingly understandable. The most common facilitator for physical activity was found to be the support from different aspects of the participant's life. Conversely, 
a lack of this support showed as a barrier. When analyzing the barriers of commitment or initiation of physical activity, the most common causes were related to time, accessibility, perceived safety of their surrounding areas, be it traffic, crime, or the conditions of the facilities and green spaces, and a lack of social and community or familial support. There is a need for further analysis that participants may not mention at first thought, such as forced athleticism in childhood, familial pressure or criticism, and personal body image. While it wasn't heavily mentioned, previous physical activity during childhood plays as both a facilitator, plays a role as both facilitator and barrier to physical activity during adulthood. The determining factor on which role it plays in the participant's life is whether or not that physical activity was of their own choosing. As stated in the earlier slide, lack of physical activity is associated with higher rates of chronic diseases or conditions along with stress, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, breast and ovarian cancer, and poor mental health. There were two studies that focused on the influence of faith-based and spirituality-based support. However, these studies included a mixed population sample of Black women and men. In one study, Black men received more support than women, and the women of this study were more likely to be to report being criticized. There needs to be more research on the relationship difference between Black men and Black, that, sorry. There needs to be more research on the relationship difference that Black men and women have with their religious community, given that this is a large pillar of most Black communities. A great deal of the studies reviewed were qualitative studies. Qualitative studies. Um, with interviewing being the only method of intervention, and some had additional interventions, including accelerometers and focus group participation. Some of the others were quantitative. However, it's not recommended for this topic at hand, given that it's rooted in the understanding of why this phenomenon occurs. The rest of the studies were a hybrid of the two, along with randomized control trials and convergent parallel designs. The most effective designs were found to be the hybrid, allowing for in-depth responses. Overall, there is a lack of research study studies on Black women's perspective of physical activity that specifically include the barriers that prevent the initiation or adherence to physical activity and the facilitators that encourage physical activity engagement. Many of the studies or literature that were found were, that were specifically related to this were at least five years old, which may not reflect the current population of Black women and their potential responses and reasonings behind their physical activity engagement or lack thereof. Though there were only two studies done to address and analyze pregnant Black women and their perspective of physical activity, many of the responses shared a fear of physical activity related to perceived harm to their baby or themselves but there were also some women who viewed it as potentially helpful for their labor and delivery process, as well as the postpartum, postpartum period. So where's the gap? There were a few articles that stated mental health and or overall stress was a bar as a barrier to physical activity. However, there was little data on those responses and other potential emotional barriers to physical activity, such as trauma. Most of the studies were conducted in one area, creating a lack of location diversity or specificity if the study did not specifically state where the study was done. In order to get a better representation of Black women, there should be a variety of sample locations. In addition to that, there's also a lack of diversity amongst the cultures of Black women who participated in these studies. Adding Black women from different areas of the African diaspora and religious backgrounds May, all, may allow for a better perspective of how culture can affect physical activity engagement as well. In the studies with mixed sample populations, there is a lack of explanation on which responses belong to which demographic. With this, the differences in responses should be in additional research to understand why each group may have these different responses. And this concludes my presentation, and I would like to thank you for listening and like to thank Dr. Taylor for the opportunity. 
Thank you so much, Rose. Excellent presentation from both of our students here. So we'd like to open the floor for uh, the audience to ask any questions you may have. We're always very proud of the students that work with us throughout the summer. And we hope that we can entice them to think about us for graduate school and for working with us in the future. Um, so if we, and I see that some members of their family may be um, on Zoom as well. So we're happy to hear from the families and friends as well, if you have questions. Oh, I see a hand, uh, Florence Almeida. Yes, um, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, that was amazing, both of you. Thank you so much for sharing your work. I'm sure it took a lot of time and effort and that was just really, really interesting. Um, I had a question for Rose. Um, I'm curious to hear more about the geographic location that you saw most of the literature coming from. Um, and if you could just speak more about the themes that you saw from that location. Um, and then I'm curious to know if you saw any differences between literature produced in the United States versus internationally on the topic. Okay, um, so most of the literature or research that was done that I found was in the United States, but specifically along the South. Um, there were only, I think, two articles that I found that were out of country and they were in Nigeria and South Africa. Um, the difference that I saw between the two of those were, um, it was more so related to the community support. Um, what I found in the Black women who were interviewed in the South of the United States, it was less likely for them to have that support um, coming from their community um, as regards to initiating working out. Um, or even just maintaining it if they had already started it. Um, it's a lot of pressure that is put on Southern Black women um, uh, compared to the out-of-country Black women that I reviewed in the articles. They were more likely to be given that time to work out and exercise. Um, yes. I hope that helped. <laughs> yes, that definitely helps. Thank you. Okay, and we have a, a hand up from Erin Perry. Yes. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, it is for Rose uh, again. So kudos to you for reviewing all of those articles. <laughs> um, I'm curious about whether you have an interest in extending that collective body of, of scholarship that you have so eloquently summarized for us today, um, but I, I thought your pointing out the lack of geographical diversity was really interesting. Um, and so I'm curious about whether maybe you have an interest in conducting interviews with Black women who are maybe based in big cities versus small cities versus rural areas or, or, or something like that. I know I'd certainly love to see you do it, but I'm just curious about whether you have an interest in something like that. Um, so I was actually just talking about this today with one of my preceptors. I am interested in extending this research um, to definitely look at larger cities um, and also expanding the like the regions in the United States of where the um, information is coming from, um, because there was not much information on the West Coast of the United States or even like the further west of the Midwest because there were some um, there was some research that was done in Ohio and Michigan, but past Illinois, there wasn't really that much research. So I would definitely like to continue that and expand further than just this kind of L-shaped belt that I found mostly throughout the research. Excellent, good luck. Thank you. Good job, Rose. Uh, we have another question from Kay Dion Posey. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Yes. We okay. Can hear okay. Um, I first of all I want to say great job to both Kendall and Rose. I think that 
One is phenomenal that in these young years you are taking to the time to contribute to such research because it's highly impactful. I was very impressed with uh, the presentations and the topics. Um, I have a question for both. Um, my first question is for Rose. What I wanted to know is, was exercise only defined in, in kind of a formal setting, like um, in terms of what most of these articles uh, defined as exercise, was it in a gym and in a formal kind of situation? Or do the things that you can do on your own, such as walking or taking, you know, um, taking the stairs versus the elevator or, you know, tracking your steps, did any seem to focus on, on that? And then I'm going to push pause for a second. And then um, Kendall, in terms of your research about not having to wait to do um, more, to have more clinical, I guess, independent clinical experience post-graduating, um, do you feel that the opportunities for the clinical engagement is available as a student. So I can let Rose go first and then hopefully Kendall can chime in. Um, okay, so in most of the research that I found, uh, physical activity wasn't necessarily defined, um, but what I did see was you know, the participants asking what they considered to be physical activity um, and they were told that it was anything involving movement. Um, so that, that did include walking, um, at home exercises, going to the gym, um, or even just doing something while standing was considered physical activity. Thank you. Um, and to add uh, to your question, basically what the research was about was people are told that they need to have clinical experience before going back to school. Uh, you asked if it's available as a student uh, to have those clinical exposure um, relatively as like a student right now come for that perspective. Um, I believe that there's limited options of clinical experience. However, um, I don't think it should be discouraged uh, to go straight to school post grad, post BSN. Thank you. And then we have a question from Dion Shell. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Great job, Rose and Kendall. It's so wonderful to see you both dive into research in your undergraduate years. Um, my question is for Kendall. So I am a healthcare professional, and I find that a lot of phys a lot of students pursue degrees in healthcare careers, such as nursing and physical therapy, um, especially if they see others who look like them in those fields. But there's limited exposure at an early age. So did it find any articles regarding um, speaking to the role of mentoring and pipeline programs for Black women who are pursuing PhDs in nursing? to inspire future generations to go into that role? I have not seen any articles. Uh, to be quite frank, I did not look into it. I think that's great to look into. Um, I would also like to add, I think it's really important as undergrad and just students and Black women, especially going into nursing, to open up a conversation about talking about graduate school, going into a PhD, because I feel like there is a lot of misconceptions and beliefs out there. Um, for example, at Ohio State, not many people know that we have a PhD program here at Ohio State as well. Um, and I think just opening those opportunities and doors and connecting and making connections within the staff and faculty is important, especially for um, women of color, black women. That's what I do in my organization here at Ohio State for nursing students of color. We create a community within the College of Nursing for minority students. And we talk about those experiences. Um, our former men, our former advisor, Dr. Tamia Nolan, she was the perfect uh, example to come to and talk to. I know she has an upcoming event uh, for you guys, so that's amazing. 
And I believe that opening mentorship um, and having programs like the one I'm in, Nursing Students of Color, I came in as a pre-nursing student, so I was not in the program. And I had that opportunity to have a mentor and it opened my eyes to, you know, Bachelor of Science in nursing and then also advanced practice nursing, including PhD. So I think that's amazing. Thank you. Great, great answer. And my next question, if I could slide it in, is for Rose. So Rose, did you find in your research if um it's beneficial for therapists to provide wellness programs to encourage those type of participants to increase their exercise levels? Did you find if that um, any articles regarding that? You and Erin, you did an amazing job going through 52 articles. Kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and actually, yes, <laughs> I did uh, find, I think it was two, no, it was three articles um, that were centered around having a wellness program for the participants to participate in. Um, and <laughs> um, they said that it was helpful. Some of them fell off That's with any program, but um, those who stayed with the program did say that having that wellness promotion and education was helpful to them in staying active um, because they better understood why it was so important for them to be active. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Good job and best of luck in your um, careers, your educational careers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And then just to get at the uh, pipeline question as well, um, I was looking at Dr. Barcelona and others here at Columbia because this is a passion of ours with pipeline programs and increasing diversity, um, particularly in nursing, because as you can, there are so few of us and we want to make sure that we are um, expanding representation at all levels of nursing. So this summer program is that we have, um, the R25 Receive program is targeted for uh, underrepresented minority students. So um, all, well, all of our students have been um, Black, Latino, and um, uh, underrepresented through the definition of NIH. Um, this has been our third, no, fourth summer um, with this program. Um, we are funded for five years, and um, I'm not sure if we will go for a renewal. I think we have a meeting this afternoon to talk about that for a competitive renewal. But that's one of the pipeline programs that we have here at Columbia that I'm uh, privileged to be one of the leads on. There are other pipeline programs that I'm a part of. I'm uh, originally from Detroit as well um, and was trained at Wayne State University. Um, with all of my degrees in nursing. And I benefited from such programs as this. Um, there was an R25 program that was led by Dr. Joseph Dunbar in the Department of Physiology. So I know, you know how much it really means and how it can really open students' eyes to other opportunities. And I think that representation is key for helping our, our students to advance in various careers, not just nursing, but anything that they set their mind um, that they want to do. Um, so other programs that we do have available, I'm uh, one of the PIs of a TL1 training program, which is for pre-docs and post-docs. Um, and we definitely do our best to increase diversity with, we have a pre-doc student here in Columbia School of Nursing, who is one of our pre-docs, Brittany Taylor. And then I'm also a PI of a T32 program which is a postdoc program. And one of our postdocs is Alexand Alexandria um, uh, Patton. And I don't know if she's on today, but she's also a woman of color that we recruited here and she works with our team. And then we also have, um, we do our best to make sure that all of our junior faculty are successful through uh, training programs through center grants. Um, and one example of that is um, we recently had a center funded on um, maternity, uh, maternal morbidity and mortality. And Veronica is one of the uh, core leads on that training uh, grant. So, you know, we do a lot to make sure that we have a pipeline and our pipeline doesn't, it starts as early as um, undergrad, but we know we can start a lot earlier and it doesn't stop. We wanna make sure that um, that all of our trainees are successful all the way through tenure or the you know 
to the pinnacle of, of their careers. So we have another question from Danielle Reeves. Hi, everyone. Um, I first wanted to just honor both of these young ladies in this space for the research that they have done and for their contributions um, as students and as um, future professionals in nursing. And I just want to say congratulations on this great accomplishment to both of you. And I have a question for both of you. Um, I wanted to know if either of you have thought about how you will um, contribute to both centering and uplifting Black women's voices and expertise in the field of nursing. And either of you can go first. Um, I can go first for this one. Um, I definitely think it starts by doing more research that center Black women um, because there isn't a lot. Um, and also, I think making connections with people who may have a bigger platform than yourself so that you could see if their values align with you in order for you to bring that to the forefront. Um, and then you together can make something bigger and bring that to people's attention. Um, I think that's important because there really is a lack of research on Black women regarding any category. <laughs> so I think that's a really big thing, just doing the research um, and getting that information out there. Going off what Rose said, I, I'm also interested in um, working with Black women. Um, like Dr. Jacqueline Taylor said, that um, I do have an interest in women's health and I would like to continue focusing on women's health, especially minority women um, and women's health. Um, and right now, kind of what I'm doing right now, uh, like I mentioned earlier with nursing students of color here at Ohio State, we're opening the conversation to what we would like to see when we are, you know, future nursing professionals, healthcare professionals, opening the conversation on topics, things we would like to see, maybe things that we would like to work on and just connecting and with other uh, black women, or minority women who are in the field right now and just making those connections and really just focusing on what we'd like to see and what we'd like to see in our future. Awesome, thank you both. And we had a comment in the chat as well. Um, um, as you can see, our, our students are sparking a lot of uh, interest and intrigue here. Um, there was Alita Harper said that she would like to have a summary of these presentations and she'd like to share Kendall's information with the PhD program that she's in in, in North Carolina. And Dr. Barcelona has noted that once the study is completed, that they will publish that paper because again, there was they didn't find much on this topic. So they're adding to the body of knowledge by doing this work. So everything that our students are doing, it's it's so important and we're so proud of them and we're glad that they're that they have this interest and that they are moving the science forward with the work that they're doing. So do we have any other questions from the audience? Well, if not, we would just like to applaud our students again. You all worked so very hard this summer. And I know a lot of you attended lots of classes and learned how to do a lot of things that, you know, um, maybe, you know, seemed onerous at first, but you you were able to just do the work head on and and, you know, able to present everything to us all the things that you did this summer that are so important. And we're so glad that you were able to spend this time with us this summer and advance the science of nursing and move these ideas and, and research forward. So again, we appreciate all the work that you've put in. We're so thankful to have had the time to work with you this summer. And please don't stop doing the work that you're doing. We hope that we have sparked some interest and that you will continue to uh, flourish in your area of interest. So thank you all for attending. It's been wonderful to hear from the students and we hope to hear a lot more on their success in the coming future. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. It's wonderful. Thank you.